Today's COVID update is brought to you by Fultech Systems, your technology center, where you'll come for the price, but stay for the service. And welcome back. Our first conversation this morning, as Marlene mentioned prior to the commercial break, is with an adjunct lecturer at Galen University. We are joined this morning by Carlos Magania, and he's going to talk to us about the budget and the putting together of the budget for the upcoming fiscal year. Good morning, Mr. Magania. Good morning, uh, Isani, and good morning, Marlene. I am privileged to be with you um, this morning and in your program. So there's a lot we'll get into in terms of the budget and the preparation of the, the financial plan. But we want to begin, first of all, um, with your take on the recent review put forward by the International Monetary Fund. I think perhaps that lays the, the groundwork for the discussion that we're going to have in terms of the upcoming budget. Let's begin there, Mr. Magania. OK, thanks. Um, before I would start the discussion there, I want to, to read two statements. Sure. One from the Whaler's Law and one from a Christian philosopher. The Whaler's Law says, nothing is impossible for the man who doesn't have to do it himself. And uh, from the Christian philosopher, Mr. Knight, he says, it's impossible to arrive at your destination unless you know where you are going. Mm -hmm. Those talks helped us to set the stage for us to be able to understand where we are going, what is expected. And the first issue that we need to understand is that we have a review of the economic condition of Belize that is done on a yearly basis mm -hmm. or every six months, depending. And we have recently been able to read or to be able to understand what has been stated by this review commission. And the review commission has really given us a interesting background on the condition that our economy is at present. And based on that condition then, it sets a stage on what can be or what would be the expectations that we Belizeans are looking forward to with a new administration and a new fiscal year. Um, they start the review of the, of the budget saying certain things that are very interesting. And uh, what they have stated is, and the first thing that they said is that uh, the pandemic, the first thing they, they look forward or state is what we have suffered for the past year. Mm -hmm. We in Belize and throughout the world. And that is the impact that COVID had had in our own small developing economy. And uh, it had a huge impact in one of our most uh, vulnerable and the largest um, economic activity that we have, which is the tourism sector. And they said that 72% of that sector was affected. Now, can you imagine your house being affected by 72% of its income in that section? Uh, so it brings and has a huge impact. And uh, that reduce the, the, the foreign exchange earnings to about 40% of our uh, GDP. As a result, it, in general, the economy contracted by 14.1%. Now, that is a huge redu reduction in our um, economy, 14.1% is is speaking about a huge amount of money yeah. um, when our our uh, gdp is almost to be uh two billion dollars as it was in um 2019 it was 1.8 this year it went down to 1.6 mm -hmm. billion us dollars so automatically we see that huge impact yeah. and it, that that has that um effect on what we are seeing and what we are experiencing today um mm -hmm. 
Now, that also, because of that, we see that there is a contraction. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, that's a, a key word here, that our economy has contracted or has had that contraction. Um, what, does, what does the word contraction mean, uh, speaking from a economic point of view? What, who is affected? Now, when there is a contraction in our economy, it means to say then that the national output, mm -hmm. your economic activity, what you do on a daily basis, what the different sectors of the economy do on a daily basis, is reduced. Mm -hmm. And once that is reduced, the whole economic activity is being also reduced. And that is by different effects. Mm -hmm. We had a pandemic as being the major cause of that effect. But apart from that, we had already seen that our national economy had been suffering certain situations. And the contraction is there is a reduction in the GDP because there is a decrease or a drop in your personal income. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, Marlene Arisani, when you have a reduction or a decrease in your personal income, that means to say that automatically you will be um, purchasing or consuming less. Yeah. And if we have a lower consumption, then it trickles down to lower production or a decrease in production. So one economic indicator impacts another economic indicator. So it's sort of like a domino and effect. Ha it's sort of like a domino Pardon. effect. It's yeah. In, in economics, we call it a trickling down effect. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, it trickles down in the in the in the economy, and and that is right. What you have said, so that we we can understand it for the general public, is like a domino effect. Mm -hmm. If you remember that your income or whatever you purchase is your expenditure, but becomes somebody else's income. And if that is being reduced, then as it trickles down, there is less and less availability of purchasing capacity. And that's why we have that trickling down effect. And, and that is what happened. And if there is less industrial production, automatically, the retail sales will be going down. So we, we clearly see that effect that happened. We all mentioned that is due to the pandemic, but to reach to that condition, it's something that had to have happened prior to. It's not simply a pandemic effect. In economics, we cannot say it's only a pandemic effect. Yes, the pandemic had its huge impact. We will not ever try to remove that from the shelf. No, mm -hmm. it is there. And, Nonetheless, and I it, think yes. that's, that's, that's a key point to hone in on. And it's one that, that one of the questions that I posed to, to the Minister of uh, State, um, uh, Christopher Coy, last week. Because what the IMF, and the IMF is, is, is only one report. It's, it's also, you know, looking at, it's kind of forecasting, but we don't know what this administration is going to roll out in terms of economic recovery. But, you know, when you talk about not returning uh, to pre-pandemic figures, which means what we were doing in 2019 until 2025, one of the things that's very essential in that conversation is that, or in that explanation, is that pre-pandemic, we were already in a recession. So if you're saying five years from now, we're going to be at the point of a recession, it still is very grim news. Yes, it is. And, uh, and this is where um, it is very critical for the new administration to really set it, it, its view, its, its strategy, its rebounding economic policy very strategically. Um, it cannot be done only on 
political desires, no. Mm -hmm. It has to be done on the reality that we have at present. We have to settle our foot on the, on, on the ground. Yeah. We, we cannot try to run we only, when we only can walk at this point. And the, the economic condition that we are right now, the, the, the picture that is painted by the IMF report is not one that helps us mm -hmm. to say that Belize is in a very good position. No, it is not. And that they do mention several things and in their fiscal um, uh, review that they do for, for us, um, they also mention that we need to be very careful very, very, very careful because um, in, 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 and I can quote what they said, fiscal policy needs to strike a balance between supporting those affected and enhancing a large public debt re reduction over the midterm. So if that is going to be a, a reality, no, they are the ones who are telling us what is our sickness. And maybe I can use a, an illustration here. Um, if you go to the doctor and the doctor tells you you have a cancer, I don't think you're going to fight back with the, with the doctor. You're going to try to work with him mm -hmm. to see in, in which best manner you can remove yourself or be able to overcome that illness. Now, our illness here in Belize is a huge debt. That is our illness. So at this point, if you, you won't fight back with those who are telling you you have an illness. What you need to do is work with those who are telling you that there is an illness to cure it. Because um, if not at the end of the day, we're all going to suffer that situation. So I'm glad you've that, mentioned, that balance. I'm glad you've mentioned yes, proceed. the diagnosis, so to speak, that in our case, our illness is a significant national debt that has, you know, impacted everyone in, at our strata in society. My question is, or an observation here, is that notwithstanding the diagnosis and the prescriptions that come about as a result of that diagnosis, as a country, our government still sort of does its own thing, so to speak, because when we talk IMF, and IMF reports and subsequent yeah. prescriptions, you hear about a homegrown economic recovery plan. You hear in the previous administration, no, we're not gonna follow what the I IMF has put forward. We're gonna do our own thing to see if we can recover the, the economy on our own. Why do we not, for whatever reason, look to what is being put forward as, as something that we would adopt in terms of turning things around? Um. Isani, it's, it's very difficult. It's very difficult as, a, as an administration. Well, I'm not part of the administration. I'm simply uh, a lecturer, I'm an economist. Yeah. And I look at it from, from that perspective, yeah. from an economist perspective. That's what, I, that's what I'm getting at. Your perspective from that of an economist. Okay, is what the IMF has set forth is because it's coming from an economic, analysis of the situation when these recommendations are being given and and by the way i must say as we read and as we analyze the report it's it's nothing that is beautiful their recommendations are very strong and uh, they highlight several occasions during the the review and this is something i wanted to discuss it but i can mention it now that we need to be very careful because if we are not careful in adhering to those recommendations, we can lose our currency peg. Mm -hmm. and, and, and what does that mean? And, and this is where the administration comes in very strong and the administration would, would say, we are not going uh, to, to permit that to happen. And, and, and that is true, it's going to be chaotic if that would happen during any administration. But the reality is that we are being told you either at higher or we can suffer. And that is what we need to, to have to be very cautious. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, the past administration didn't really took many of the recommendations into account. 
where we are to be. Tell me where we are to be. So this so, is... Yes, continue, Marvin. And I was going to say, because, uh, and I guess that's, that's kind of the, the question that, that Isani is asking, that when we hear of these reports, and I really appreciate you being able to kind of break it down so we understand the gravity of what is being reported by the IMF. We hear of them, we often report them in the media, a few people do read and digest them, um, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's a prescription, well, it doesn't mean it's a course of action that will be taken by any administration. They do have a choice. And I think that the picture has always been painted that reports like these um, aren't very sensitive or recommendations made in reports like these are very sensitive to the realities of the human beings involved. When you talk of uh, cutting down public debt, if it does include, or increasing taxes, um, these are some of the areas where it becomes very difficult politically mm -hmm. to be able to execute. And, and that is correct. And, and because if that would happen during the course of any administration, the public at large mm -hmm. will not understand that what we are suffering or being recommended, it's because we have been lacking for years mm. to follow what is being recommended. Uh, and if we still continue not adhering to these recommendations, and you and uh, you have stated it correctly, they are recommendations. Mm -hmm. We are we as a country can decide to adhere to the recommendations. We can decide not to. We can, can look at them. We can sit down. We can develop strategies based on the recommendation, and we can be able to to rebound. And we might not need to go through that specific recommendation. We can find a, a, a solution that runs parallel so that the medicine, for example, there's some medicines that a doctor gives that are, that are yeah. sour, mm -hmm. bitter. Mm -hmm. okay? but, but you can find in, in, in the market, in, in, in the pharmaceutical market, another medicine that you can drink that has the same effect, but it's a little less bitter. So this is what I want to say, that yeah. once the recommendation is given, the national executive now sits down, looks at it, studies it objectively, analyzes it, looking at their own expectations and what they want to do as an administration for the next five years. So that is what they will be working with now, looking at that. Yeah. Nonetheless, so, yes. So moving, moving, and, and, and I appreciate what you have outlined with, with uh, the IMF report, but let's, let's bring it home. You know, we are approaching the end of the financial year, and there is a, a very legitimate challenge on the table. The IMF has said, but that uh, you know about reducing public, um, about reducing the 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 amount of expenditure, how much government is spending on salaries. Um, but this is something that has been discussed long before, even with the previous administration, and it was something that we knew had to be addressed at this point in time. And there's a stalemate. Um, there's a current reg uh, recommendation by government. There is opposition to that recommendation, and that has to be sorted through. But the budget eventually has to be read. And I want you to, to talk to me from, from an economic, uh, economist point of view. What are some of the areas that you are going to be focusing on when you hear the budget presentation when it's made? OK. Um, what would be some of the points? The, what I am expecting mm -hmm. is that there has to be some reduction on the wage bill. That, that has to happen. Um, as, as fiscal action, um, 
the government has to reduce its expenditure at all levels, at all levels. We, we're not going to, to say that it is going to happen at this level or at the other level. No, no, it has to happen at all levels across the board. It's going to save millions of dollars. But in the, doing that, what are you going to do with that amount of money that in principle is going to be saved? Is it really going to be saved? Do we really have that money at hand? Mm -hmm. Will we really have that availability to use that money? Or it's simply a figure of value that we are reducing? Do we have the, the, does the government have available that liquidity that is going to be saved? Okay. Well, that's an excellent that question. If I, if, I could, if I could jump in quickly here. While we're saying, okay, we need to realize X amount of millions of dollars in savings over the next three years, then what would be the purpose of those monies? Once we've accrued the $240 million in this case, what do we then do? Where do we invest it? Where does it come from? As you've mentioned, do we have it in liquid form? How does that come about? Can you explain that to us? Okay. Um, whenever the, the, the government would say that there is, uh, that we are getting or that we are being able to save mm -hmm. a certain amount of money, it is in record. And the, the government collects revenues, government makes loans to be able to balance off its budget. So if they are collecting revenues and making loans to balance off that, and they are able to get the amount or collect the amount of expected income for the government, then the money is going to be there. How is it going to be used? Some of my recommendations here is, some of being done presently, uh, we see that there is a high movement to the agriculture sector. We yeah. as an economy, we are an agriculture focused mm -hmm. economy together with tourism. Those are the two main pillars that we have. And we also need to see, and I am also expecting in the budget to see if there are going to be new industries because that is what will definitely bring employment and employment is going to bring in economic activity and then it's going to have a multiplier effect in the economy and the rebounding and such but it has to be with increasing or bringing in new industries if i would ask a question and comes to, to the mind if we look at the past 15 years, what new industries have we had in our economy? Not expansion of present industries, no. New industries, very minimal, yeah. very that's, minimal. That's a, that's a key point, and I think, you know, we, I, I want to pick up on that one because that's, that's a part of the innovation that is necessary uh, for uh, any kind of economic rebound. So. What we'll do right now, uh, Carlos, is take a very quick break, and when we come back, we'll pick up right on that point. So please stay with us, and for viewers at home, stay tuned. When someone you love becomes a memory, the memory becomes a treasure. Channel 5 introduces the Daily Obituaries. The Daily Obituaries will broadcast all death and funeral announcements and memorials to honor your loved one's life and memories. The Daily Obituaries airs on Channel 5 prior to the evening newscast with subsequent repeats at 10 p.m. and 12 noon the following day. It will also be placed online on our social media platforms, all for a standard package fee. Celebrate their lives and memories with Channel 5 Daily Obituaries. Honor in life and reverence in death.
and welcome back. We're continuing our conversation this morning with an adjunct lecturer. He's an economist, um, Carlos Magania, and he's talking to us about the budget. Now, Mr. Magania, we were talking prior to the commercial break about uh, new industries and the viability of bringing on board um, additional sectors to the economy. Let's continue there. Okay, yes, as, as I was mentioning, I, I do believe in my vision that one of the things that we definitely need to do is to bring in those new industries because that is what will factor in new employment. I, am, I, am, I do believe that expanding present industries is fine, it's great, it's good work. But when you start to bring in new industries, you start to use the capacity of the Belizean population. Mm -hmm. There are so many uh, individuals who have different types of skills and knowledge mm -hmm. acquired at home and abroad. And many of these skills, knowledges, knowledge, sorry, capacity, they're not being used in our economy. And if they are not being used, then it's a waste of human resource. And this is where the, the government and this is where the national executive needs to look at, need to sit down and analyze what are the new industries that we need to bring in so that we can be able to start moving with new vision our economy. That's the only way that they will start rebounding. That's, that's such a critical point. Um, you know, when we look at, at, at the tourism industry and how, how much we relied on that particular sector um, for, for bringing in the majority of the revenue in the country, um, and when that collapsed, and we were commenting earlier, mm -hmm. pre pre before Belize detected its first case, um, we very clearly saw the fallout, the massive unemployment that took place, uh, the, the strain um, and scramble for foreign exchange. And I do, I mean, do you think that this is, this is a, a critical lesson, a very hard lesson that we have learned through this pandemic? that a sole reliance on a tourism-based economy is a very uh, 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 difficult, difficult um, thing to maintain. Um, any economy that relies only on one or two of its um, sectors to sustain mm -hmm. it becomes vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And that vulnerability that happens in the economy, we have learned the lesson. And, and I am sure that now we as Belizeans definitely, definitely are going to find other, um, we're going to look at other sectors in the economy and we're going to, to start to balance off that we do not only depend on one, because tourism, if we saw, gives about 45% of one of our gross domestic product. Now, that is too high. We saw the impact that. That, that it has. Agriculture, if we focus on agriculture, agriculture has so many um, options. There are so many ways that we can expand in agriculture. Um, there is, yeah. and, and as, as an economist, I, I know that this is a point of debate anytime it comes, and uh, that is, should we do offshore drilling or not? Now, when you find yourself that your house is breaking down, mm -hmm you're going to find and you're going to do what is necessary and what needs to be done. Now, I have my position on that. I see the pros, I see the cons, but if your economy starts to call, then you need to expand. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, for example, even, uh, even things Rica, like the, what, cannabis, yes. the cannabis industry that has been on, on the table for a while, and I know that comes with its own challenges as well, but what I'm hearing from you it's very similar to what, what the Minister of State said. He said there are some tough decisions to be made. Um, and and it, I, I assume that that also means unpopular in some cases because what you're saying is that if we know that tourism is, is going to eventually come back, we, we have such a beautiful product, there's no way people won't want to come. 
agriculture has been our base, and, and we've heard the Prime Minister speak of, of moving towards uh, value-added products as well, but what else will we then introduce as an additional source of income for the country um, that allows us to balance off where we've been relying, um, what, what we've been relying on for a while. So uh, those are some of the, the tough decisions that we elect leaders who should be able to make decisions that's in the best interest of the overall country. And I do believe that the leaders have been elected to do that, and I am sure they are going to do that yeah. in the best interest of our country. I have no doubt. Yeah. The lesson learned is not an easy one. Yeah. That lesson that we have learned because of not adhering to the public at large discussion, yeah. mm -hmm. because of not adhering to international recommendations, because we want to do things on our own, and not developing strategies that will help the economy to be sustainable in the, in the long run, then that is why we are where we are today. Yeah. That lesson has been learned. And I am sure that the, the national executive is going to do their best, that we do not continue where we are. We are to move forward. Yeah. And uh, listening to, to several of the, of the members of cabinet, how they are expressing themselves. I do believe that they will be looking forward to that. I was going to bring in the example of what happened in Costa Rica, what was done in Costa Rica through Intel. Mm -hmm. um, they, they are a country that we know today for, for um, technology. Mm -hmm. yeah. They produce a lot of technology. But did Costa Rica had that? No. They open their doors to Intel so that Intel can come in and start developing at low cost because of, of the, the, the wage, uh, the, what was being paid to them, the salaries is very low. So they use Costa Rica and they develop. And in so doing, they also work together with the Ministry of Education and they established special education um, institutions so that they would be that they would have their own people being educated in what intel needed so at the at the end of the day it was a benefit to the gdp because intel brought in a lot of, of um, yeah. foreign exchange and the added value to that as you have mentioned my lady what would be added value the added value was education Education, and, and you see that people throughout Central America, and even from the beginning, travel to Costa Rica to be educated. Yeah. So that was the added value that they had, taking that initiative of bringing in that new type of industry into their economy. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I, I think that um, that's also, as, as we have this conversation, a part of it is to help people to recognize um, what we need to be paying attention to. And so while we do elect leaders to make these decisions, we keep them accountable by asking, um, you know, uh, where is the innovation? What are the new industries? Um, how else are we going to earn uh, money for the country? And, and how do we get there? Um, looking at the presentation itself, Joe, uh, one of the things that, that I was sharing with you off camera is um, being able to see where we will be able to, how the budget will be divided in this upcoming um, presentation, in this upcoming financial year. I want to get your thoughts on that because there are some ministries that are just simply essential. You know, what, uh, we're in the middle of a health crisis, so what happens with Ministry of Health? Um, we know we have, have had consistently a challenge with uh, security issues when you talk about crime in particular areas. Let me ask from your perspective, when you look at the, the explanation of the budget and where the allocations are made, what do you pay attention to? Okay, the, the, that's a very interesting question, uh, Marlene, because administrations prepare budgets based on their present condition. And based on the present condition that we see today, 
we cannot evade that crime is spiking in the last, we, we, the, what we are seeing now. Okay. And will it continue? It's, it's a social problem. Yeah. And, and if people do not have employment, and if the, the young people are not employed, they will find things to do. And, and mischief is one of the most things that, that, that they would be getting into. And the, the, if they are offered certain things, they're going to accept that offer and they're going to commit crimes, crimes of all sorts. And so I am definitely seeing that there has to be a, a large allocation, but if, if, if permit me to say this, it mm -hmm. needs to be strategically allocated. What do you it's mean not, by that? Okay, that is what I'm going to explain right now. It's not going to be simply a budget line. Ah. You need to work in that budget line with social partners, organizations, entrench with them strategies to see that these individuals will start to reduce crime. Crime reduction is not simply a state of words. No, words do not reduce crime. It is action. And to do that, it needs budget. It needs financing. You need to, to develop maybe um, other schools, um, develop a, institutions that are going to work, NGOs that are going to work with these individuals. And NGOs are not going to be simply brought up without any funding. It needs to have funds. And so to, to reduce crime, it's not simply an action of, I will do this. No, it needs financing. So the reduction, what, what I can think of, and, and maybe to, to give an idea is, the monies that are going to be saved from the wage bill, because it has to be done. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I might be criticized, I might be, but I am an, an independent thinker. And as an economist, that has to happen. There is no two ways. It has to happen. The, the wage bill has to be reduced. As, as teachers, we have to be able to, to understand that it is an action. This is not unionism. This is not fighting. No, no, this is economics. Mm -hmm. We either cross it or we all drop into the river. The, 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 the international community is not going to say, okay, unions, because of, no, no, they're not going to say that. They have already set the scenario of where we are. Mm -hmm. they, they have said, this is where you are. You're going to do this. Okay, so the monies that are going to be saved from that wage bill cut can be set to the agriculture sector, can be set to um, reduce crime, but creating organizations that can do so. And once these individuals reduce crime, then we're going to have a safer society. A safer society creates more consumption because we're gonna have more people that will be willing and will find it beautiful to come back to that belief that we had many years ago. And when people come to Belize, they consume. And that is what we need in our economy. We need consumption. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If, if we do not consume, we will say, um, OK, fine, uh, uh, production is going to decrease. There is an argument we're discussing with another colleague. He told me, but, but Carlos, if we do not consume, if our salary then, there's going to be a trickling down effect. That is the normal thinking. Mm -hmm. But the Sani and Marlene want to say the following. Whatever is being um, saved in that line, the government is going to use it in other strategic uh, structures. And therefore, other people are going to receive that. And that money will still trickle or still have that multiplier effect in the economy. It's not that you're going to stop that in the economy. No, you're going to move it from one sector into the yeah. other. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's going to build up in other individuals, let other me, sectors. Let me digress for a quick second here. And we're talking economics still. We're looking at 
reducing the wage bill for teachers and public officers. Those of us in the private sector, we've already taken a, a pay cut from last year. So we're still sort of rebounding from that. When you look at the financial restrictions, if I may, and you look at the cost of living where everything else has gone up, if we're saying, look, we're going to take X amount of dollars out of the local economy, and we're going to repurpose it for some other use elsewhere in the, the government expenditure or what have you, then less people are going to be able to afford some of the basic necessities that they would have you know, been able to purchase had they not been impacted by this particular withdrawal of monies. Can you speak to a scenario like that? Okay, let me see if I got your, your scenario. We are reducing the, the income of the, of the teachers. Mm -hmm. Okay, that reduction, 5, 10%, whatever it is, um, that will not be reduced from the economy. Mm -hmm. No, that money is still going to be in the economy, but channeled Elsewhere. to other sectors. And once it's channeled to other sectors, the economic activity continues, but it continues in other where it can create or if it is strategically. And this is why I use the term strategic. Yes. It needs to be strategically um, diverted to other individuals who are going to bring Activity. Yes, Carlos, I understand, I understand that. I'm saying nonetheless that their spending power will still be reduced. So whatever they could have afforded in the first instance, the fact that they're now taking a, a wage cut, they won't be able to afford some of these basic necessities. And we're saying that everything else has gone up. The standard and the cost of living has gone up considerably. And now we're looking at a situation where their wages are going to be reduced considerably as well, and so they won't be able to afford. And if you are saying to me, well, that affects productivity inevitably, then what becomes of that situation? That is my question. Okay, and that is what I'm trying to let you understand. Mm -hmm. I have $10 in this hand. Yeah. I will only be able to use eight now. The other $2, I'm going to put it in this hand. And I'm going to use it in this hand. So I still have the $10. Mm -hmm. I still have the $10. Mm -hmm. And this $2 that I have here now can help me to do other things, not only what I can do with this hand. I have another avenue so that I can then trickle economic activity. Mm -hmm. So what you are saying is one sector is going to be affected mm -hmm. but much others are going to be positively impacted mm -hmm. if strategically and i use the word again strategically diverted yeah. to be invested so that the economy can rebound that's interesting yeah. that's interesting you know and and uh, maybe well, we're not at the point of the budget presentation and we're nearing the end of the financial year, but uh, that would be, I think, a very valid question that the unions can ask. What will happen with the savings that are made from this wage cut? What will it go will it towards? Be? Yeah, mm -hmm. um, because another element, and that's why I was asking you about, let's, let's talk a bit about our budget allocations. We know education takes up the bulk of the budget. We know right now, if you're to look at priority areas, health is one of our priorities. We also know that we have had issues with uh, security, and so that's also, that's also been a continuous priority. But then at the same time, as we have clearly pointed out in the past uh, half an hour to 40 minutes, it's a very grim state that we're in, and if you trickle that down to households where there's unemployment or reduced income, People are struggling. So what happens with human development and social assistance programs? So there are all these competing priorities from a very small pie to start with. So what, what are some of the key areas? And, and again, you need to be able to allow for space for 
more investment to take place and for expansion of new industries. So when we, when we look at all these competing factors, it does make it quite a difficult job. Yes. Um, the, the national executive uh, needs to look at foreign direct investment as uh, one of the immediate uh, situations that can help us now. There are the pros and there are the cons to a foreign direct investment. We know the impact that it has in the long term, but we also know the positive impact that it can have in the short term. Now, so in, in, in preparing that, that budget uh, allocation, it, it becomes very, very um, interesting that you only have a certain amount of money, but we, we need to see that that amount of money is used. Mm -hmm. Health cannot be um, set aside. No, we are in a, in a still ongoing situation with COVID. Uh, the world is testing possible solutions, but we have not been, we have not reached a point and say, okay, it is safe now. Mm -hmm. We're still in, a, in, in that position of testing. So we don't know what can happen um, in the next six months uh, with, with the pandemic. It, it can just turn into something worse, or it can be, we can start to see that it, around the world, it's it just started to decrease and, and it's positive yeah. for the world economy and for our local economy because we're a tourism-based industry. Yeah. Okay. so. So the, the, where is it going to be allocated? Health has to receive it. A country's human resources is developed through education. So education has to be able to, um, to receive its, its necessary allocation. Agriculture needs to, to receive because we, know, uh, we don't want to keep only in, in the tourism factor. We need also to, do, to, to, to see that the agriculture sector receives the necessary input. The um, roads network is critical. Now, it's critical when it goes and it is being created or being expanded, Shari, I shouldn't use the word created. It's expanded where we have production, where it can create more economic activity. I, I'm going to use this as an example. Yeah. We have a road that is going to Caracol. Fine. Aesthetics. It's going to look good. How much will it produce in the national economy to be seen in the future? We don't know. But if that money, which is very difficult to be um, taken back or, 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 or yeah. not being um, used for that specific project. It's very difficult. It's, and I think it's almost, to use the term, almost impossible. Yeah. None, but if that would have been used from a different perspective, you could have still used it for, for the um, infrastructure or roads network, mm -hmm. but where we see that there is productivity uh, for example, I, I am from the north, and uh, being a former CEO of the King Farmers, I clearly know what is the struggle that they pass through their sugar roads. But with that amount of money that is being used to go to one um, tourist center, how much miles of the, the road network in, in the north could have been upgraded yeah. Cave, reduce the expenditure of the cane farmer, mm -hmm. and in that way, that money that he would be able to save from buying parts mm -hmm. and a lot of other things, he consumes much more fuel because he has to brakes and continue, brakes and continue. All that money that he would be saved, he would be able to set it then in the agriculture mm -hmm. yeah. or producing more, more um, um, sugar cane. So these are just some of the examples yeah. of where you prioritize. Well, and yeah, and I, I appreciate what you're what you're using as an example. Um, and and it's uh, it has been 
one of the examples that we've heard of very often, whether or not when uh, money is allocated for a particular project, whether it is in the best interest of the country overall and has more long-term impact. Um, as you noted and as we, we have heard uh, clearly from this administration, it seems that there is uh, pretty much a lock-in to completing that road. But using that as a lesson, when we hear the budget presentation coming up, these are the types of things very early on that we should say, hold on, is this going to be most beneficial to all the lesions and is this what we need at this time? I, as, as, a, as a university lecturer, um, I'm, I'm, my question is, do you get a sense that your students who are uh, in the university and, and the people that you converse with on campus when, when there's a class, that there's a sense of, interest and awareness about uh, the people's role in paying attention and maintaining accountability? Yes, there, there is. Yeah. There is. Um, students, uh, I believe that the students today are looking forward and are much more open-minded to our national issues. Fantastic. Okay, they, they are much more open. Um, there are many of my students who are from both political um, major parties uh, followers, and some of them want to, to continue their, their political aspirations in, in both political uh, major political parties. And, and they, they do bring in a lot of discussion. They do bring in a lot of questions um, when it comes to that. And, and I try to set the, 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 the scenario or the picture that if we are suffering what we are today, we have learned that lesson. Mm -hmm. They are going to be the change factors mm -hmm. of our little beliefs, of our jewel. Yeah. They, they are going to be the ones to set a new, a new beginning, if we can use that term. Mm -hmm. Because when they reach into office, they have seen, they have seen through their life, their short life, what has been our suffering. Um, coming back now to, to, to where I would really want to say is, and, and the, the main discussion this morning is expectations of the budget. Yeah. The, the, the expectations. Yeah. If we look at what has been the past budget's readings, we, we, if, you, if you would read it in detail, you wouldn't be able to identify rural development you hear these we're going to expand in electricity we're going to do this but where are the rural development programs we are we as a country we have the urban and the rural sectors the 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 rural sectors bring in economic activity into the urban area the urban area is developed because there is a high urban activity so if the urban, uh, sorry, if the rural um, area is really um, developed, if the rural area has a lot of economic activity, they are going to bring in those resources into the urban area. And they're going to purchase and take it back mm -hmm. to the rural and the development continues. So we need to see, and, and my expectation is to see in this coming budget, what is going to be the rural impact? Mm -hmm. What are going to be the projects, one by one listed, if any, that are going to impact the rural communities? Mm -hmm. they are the, they, they're the ones who, on a day-to-day, -day, they are working. Um, Producers. Uh, I, I have seen the, the, the Minister of Agriculture touring the country, and, and I am very happy to see that because I think it's one of a kind, one of its kind. We have not seen that in, in, in years that the minister tours, looking, understanding, mm -hmm. getting an, a, a first hand information on what is needed. And, and I do believe I can be wrong but i do believe that in the budget we're going to see 
that rural impact a discussion being presented there. I am looking forward to that. So um, this is where I, I, I would, would say, no, it's not that we want to leave the, the urban area once I know. The urban area has its own, its own challenges. Yeah. Um, and uh, we, we have, um, is there sufficient space, the, mm -hmm. the, the housing for, for, the, for the urban area? Um, looking specifically to Belize City, the, there are some areas that are totally being neglected. What is going to be the, how is it that this new administration in its budget in the, in the housing program, we're going to see that your budget is limited. Yeah. How are you going to bring that well, about? And you know what's going to be interesting as you, as I'm hearing you speak, I'm, I'm thinking of all the, the, the past criticisms of, of budgets of the past where uh, the details in the line items for allocations weren't also clear. So hopefully that will be something we see in this budget presentation as well, because as you outlined earlier, um, it's not just about saying this is your allocation, but being strategic about where it's going to go and with what purpose. Yeah, uh, and uh, this this is what and uh, this is what we really want to to, to determine here. The, that strategy. What are we going to do? The, the word strategy is not simply used in my comments as a word. No, I am really expecting that ministries entrench, yeah. ministries combine, and uh, you are the minister of X ministry, and I'm the minister of another um, ministry. So we come together, yeah. and I tell you. Marlene, Sani, what do you need? I'm not, I'm not speaking that I am the finance man. No, no. Yeah. I'm speaking that I am one of those ministers and let us work together. Because if we do not intertwine, if we do not network, and every ministry wants to work independently, the strategy is not going to work. To, and to and let me that. just jump in with that there. Because uh, Minister of State, uh, Honorable Koyi, uh, spoke of the... the fact that the government is simply too big. We have 17 cabinet members and we have one minister of states as well. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, I, I, reducing the, the ministries will vision wise could be a possibility so that there can be a, a better strategy working together. But nonetheless, when we have independent ministries as how they are right now, there is a more thinking capacity. I repeat that. There is a more thinking analytical capacity in different sectors of the economy. It has its pros, it has its cons. Yeah. And I do believe that if the present administration is looking forward to seeing a total different working scenario, the ministry, the number of ministries won't really impact the wage bill because they're going to produce. And if they produce, and if they're able to work together, then it's going to bring in much more economic activity. Because, OK, let, let's set it like this. Isani has a little business. Marlene has a little business. I have a little business. But if only Isani has the three businesses, mm -hmm. then it becomes more difficult. But if you, if the three of us have these three small businesses, then we can work together and there are going to be three different areas to expand that business, bringing it now into the national economy. Yeah. Having much, uh, an, an expansion in the ministries, it's a good idea, it's a good vision because we have yeah. much more option but of while... individuals thinking, right, right. individuals thinking yeah. of how they can work together to rebound the economy. But yes, while, while while I hear your point in, in, in seeing the vision of having more persons 
dedicated to so ministries in the times that we are today? Is it a financially smart decision? Interesting question. Though because the word that you use is smart. No. This this is this sets um, a condition here. Reducing the number of ministries will reduce the wage bill under no circumstance. Mm -hmm. okay? We will not argue that point. Reducing. But at the same time, you're going to have individuals with higher responsibilities, mm -hmm. with higher number of um, some committees to be able to, to, to so attend. So they'll be managing more people. Uh, yeah, and more much responsibilities. More, and if you do that, mm -hmm. do you become more efficient? Okay. Or you become less efficient? Mm -hmm. That's a fair argument. Yeah, well. Okay, so when we say that we want to bring in a new vision, we're also speaking about Efficiency. Yeah. How efficient are we going to be? Uh, and th this, this Marlene, is just a beginning of a discussion in so many other things well, that our present economy is. Yeah. Yes, you were going to say something. I was going to say, you know, and I and I'm glad that that you indulge us in in discussing these topics. Very often, people shy away from talking about the budget for some reason, but this is where we need to take the public discourse. The, my decision, uh, the decisions that are made um, can be discussed or the proposals that are put forward can be discussed and we can have different opinions on them and try to bring some clarity as to why you feel a particular way versus someone else does. In, in, in moving forward, I do hope that we can have you uh, after the presentation has been made so we can dissect it even further. But for now, we're looking at where to keep our focus and, and as you said very clearly, I think I better go managing the expectations as well. Yeah. So, yeah. as I, as I, if I may um, mm -hmm. determine, or, or no, I shouldn't use the word determine, look forward to myself. I am anxious to see what is going to be in the budget presentation. As an economist, yeah. I am, I am, I want to see because that is going to give me an idea of will we have a rebound yeah. or are we going to continue in a status quo okay. and if we continue in a status quo we are definitely playing with our exchange peg mm -hmm. well, we, Carlos, we will be playing with it Carlos you have you have already scripted for us the first question we will ask you uh, when the budget has been presented as to whether we're maintaining status quo or if we're moving towards a rebound. So I look forward to that conversation. It's, it's going to be my privilege. It's going All to right. be my privilege. And uh, it's up to you um, in administration in, in, in Channel 5. I am yeah. more than willing to come in and discuss any economic topic um, that you all would be willing to. We appreciate it. Thank you very much. And stay well, safe. Thank you. I, with this, what I would say, I hope Belize the best, and I hope that national executive would be really looking forward to that strategic um, action to rebound our economy. It's a network capacity from all ministries so that that can happen. All right. Thank you very much. And with that, we are going to go ahead and take a break. And when we return... It's with the Labor Commissioner to talk about the new system that is being rolled out. This COVID update was brought to you by Foltech Systems, your technology center, where you'll come for the price, but stay for the service.